Good afternoon, everybody. It is Monday, March 8th, 2021. And I thought I would break down the ARC Innovation Fund for you. Not only when to probably buy that, but where to cherry pick some of the underlying holdings and how to understand really why the uh, fund is diving the way that it is. So why don't we get rolling here? I published this just a little while ago. ARC Innovation Fund, one of the best funds the last five years, uh, depending on how you rank things, it's usually top 1% and has done very, very well up until the past few weeks. I first suggested this fund uh, very late in 2018 and had a lot of uptake on it. And I mentioned it a few more times as we went. And uh, I know that for a lot of people, this became a, uh, an important holding for them. I don't think anybody anticipated that it would go up 150% in nine months at one point, but it did pretty well uh, all along the way, generally beating QQQ with a lot of the types of stocks that I've been talking about for four or five years now, which is a lot of the mid cap stocks that are growing that are eventually going to replace the zombie companies in the S&P 500 and other companies that just don't have secular growth. With the pandemic, obviously, we probably added another 100 zombie companies to what might have been 60, 70, or 80 at the start. And now we're probably around 200 zombie companies. And that gives an opening to your mid caps. And in a lot of cases, uh, some of these SPACs, I just read that there's been 463 SPACs or something since last year. Clearly, not all of them are going to do well. A lot of them are just going to give their money back minus a fee. You know, there's not a lot of great SPACs out there, but there's a number and we seem to have a good way of doing that. I'll be calling Matt Tuttle actually uh, this week and doing a podcast for you about SPACs. The ARC chart, I think, is important for us to take a look at. As you can see, it rallied all the way up here to a 4.618 level. So these are called extension levels based on a rally, a peak, and then a trough. And that's where the purple lines come from. Typically, the 1.68 line, 1.618 line is where you normally would see a target, sometimes 2.618. And you'll notice when this rally got to 1.618, it jitterbugged, and then it broke through. Then at 2.618, it took a couple tries to break through. And then it had this huge rally all the way up to a 4.618 level. That almost never happens. So this rally here, which I called the most unjustified rally I've ever seen, is now giving it all back. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, where is ARC going? I think that this orange box is going to end up being about right. Here's why. When you take a look at the core holdings, Tesla and Square are about 16% of the portfolio. That's one-sixth. So it's a pretty big position in two stocks, but there's more. Tesla has a $1.5 billion exposure to Bitcoin, which they're up a little bit on right now. They probably bought it right around $40,000 per Bitcoin based on the dates that they gave us that they were doing the buying, which was the end of January and start of February. Square has made $170 million of investments into Bitcoin. The first 50 million was at about $10,000 a Bitcoin. The rest of it was later and much more expensive, but they too are profitable. Their first batch, the initial 50 million, was worth 136 million just a few months later. The more recent batches, they're probably close to even on maybe a shade up. And what both companies have done is they've taken a piece of money that is from the reserves that they don't look at as needing for business purposes in the shorter intermediate term. So they can invest it longer term. In Tesla's case, they're talking about letting people buy Teslas with Bitcoin. In Square's case, they're on the cutting edge of, of cryptocurrency. Interesting with Square is that even if Bitcoin tanks uh, due to regulation and, and the government making it harder for people to use, outside of a commodity type framework, Square has some very interesting technology that should put them ahead of the game, even if you know we move towards the crypto dollar, which I've been talking about for a while now. With 
Tesla and Square, I think you have to look at these companies, A, based on their business operations, and B, what is Bitcoin really doing for them? In the case of Square, it's about 5% of their reserves. It's a bigger percentage for Tesla. I'm not a big fan of Tesla at this point anymore because I think that the hype money, the easy money has been made. I think that they have a lot of competition coming, and I don't know that they really have any sustainable advantage over anybody else at this point. So I am much more interested in Square because as small business comes back, I think Square is going to do tremendous. Uh, it's going to ebb and flow with the economy. They might at some point take a knock because of the Bitcoin, uh, but I do like it uh, on the pullbacks. So the Tesla chart, you know, if it got back under 500 and you were a big Tesla believer, this is probably where you want to buy it. Um, I'm not so sure that it doesn't chop in here for years and years, though, to be honest with you. It's not quite oversold on the weekly chart. So it has some room to go down. Very easily could get down to under 500. Square on the daily chart has peaked and is coming back. It didn't quite get to a 4.618, but it got to the 3.618, which is still pretty high. Looks like it's going to come back down in this range. The blue line is what's called a retracement. So from peak, from trough to peak, these are the levels where you'd normally target some correction. And this 50.5, it's fairly typical to get to. You've heard people talk about uh, retracements of about half of the bottom to the top. That's what that would be. So right around 160, you'd have to start looking at square and going, okay, how much downward momentum is there? Is this roughly fair value? Somewhere in here is probably fair value right now without discounting a ton of the growth. So if we can get down here into this orange box, which is all the way down to this 1.618 extension target and the, and the 0.618 retracement target, somewhere between 145 and 131. Uh, you know, a, a price in the 140s or 130 would be pretty attractive to me for Square. So that's what we're looking for. Now, think about what if Tesla and Square both drop another 10 to 20% and it's one sixth of the value of ARC. You could lose about three, up to three points. In my example, I had Tesla losing 10% and Square losing 20. That would knock about two points off. So I cover the math in here. So that's two to three points off of ARC just from those two stocks. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the other top holdings. You've got Roku and Teladoc, which are five to 6% holdings. What if they both drop 20%? Take another two points. Baidu, Zillow, Spotify, Shopify, Zoom, CRISPR, Invite, Exact Sciences, all between 2.5% and 3.5%. What if they all drop about 20%? Now you'd be shaving another four points off. And let's suggest that the rest of the portfolio okay, has another 20% downside. So 60% of the portfolio times a 20% drop, that's 12 points. When you add it all up, and I might have actually done the math wrong here, you're looking at a pretty big drop. It's a drop well into the teens. In any case, some teen percentage downside is left just based on the corrections you can see in the holdings on ARC. Okay, so what does that look like? Well, it got down to around 109 today. What would a 15% drop look like there? About 16 points, 16 bucks. Well, 16 bucks gets you down to low 90s. That's below the first entry level here, which was the 2.618, gets you down to this 0.5 at 96, puts you in the middle 90s right in there. And if it falls all the way down to the 0.618 retracement level from this low to that high, and then 0.618 down, which is a typical target that you can use, it's something that happens over and over again, you could get ARC in the low 80s. And that would imply that all these companies that we're talking about took 10 to 20% diggers. So that's what you should be looking at with ARC. This chart is about right. You know, this is what we've been working from for a while now. You know, when I was drawing this as it was going up, people were like, oh my God, it's never going to get back down here again. Well, it might. It could even head down into the 60s if the Federal Reserve is slow handed in keeping the long end of the curve from going up much more. You know, that is really what the noise is out there is that, well, if interest rates go up to 1.6, 1.7, 1.82 on the 10-year treasury, 
now all of a sudden that's an even bigger headwind for a lot of stocks that are out there. So we'll see how far the Fed allows the 10-year Treasury to go. I can't imagine it's too much higher. I think two is probably about you know where they really want to make sure that it stops. That's the spot where the people buying the 10-year Treasury aren't getting a negative real return. And remember, Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, is owned by the big banks. The big banks are buying the treasuries. There's going to be some quid pro quo there. If I can get ARC in the low 80s, I'm going to be very excited because I think that a lot of these companies are in good shape. I wish that she would hold less Tesla, bring it down to a 4 or 5% position. I think at 9 or 10, it's too much. I think that it served its purpose. And if they get in trouble with Bitcoin, or if I'm right, and companies like Ford and Volkswagen and GM have a bigger role in the EV future than people think about right now, you know, then Tesla could, you know, go even further down and that could push this all the way down in here. So I'm going to keep an eye on what Kathy Wood is doing. If she's buying a bunch of Tesla at 500, I don't think that excites me. But if she's just letting it stay where it is, I'd be better with that. So when we take a look at the other holdings in here, what do we want to cherry pick? Well, Teladoc, PayPal, and DocuSign are all on our lists, right? So here's Teladoc. Went all way up, way up here. Way past the 2.618. Couldn't quite make the 3.618. And almost straight down. Kind of like on track. I think that Teladoc is very close to being a buy. Obviously, you don't want to buy it until the downward momentum is gone. This is the weekly chart. It's not quite oversold yet. Wait for the reds of their eyes. Let the weekly chart get oversold. And then start selling puts or buying the stock. Huge growth potential. PayPal, not quite as good as Square at the ground level, but online probably better. So for subscription-based companies or online transaction-based companies, PayPal is really a big deal versus the shop at the corner that uses something for your credit card. That's more Square's territory. Given the rise in online business, I really like PayPal too. So between PayPal and Square, I really feel like I need to get both of them into my portfolio at the right price. This is going to be on the new plug and play that's coming out in a couple of weeks. So get ready for it. It's been on the plug and play in the past. It'll be back now. It'll replace something. Good, good correction. Got all the way to a 4.618. I mean, that's just a, a monster rally. So it needs to get back down in here somewhere. I think that this orange box is about right. Getting down towards this 1.618 level, the 0.5 level, the 618. This is really where you'd expect it to get to. Based on the underlying fundamentals of the company, I think that's entirely justifiable as a fair value estimate. And in the blockchain future, um, PayPal and Square are going to have a role. I don't know how that's exactly going to look when the digital dollar comes out, but they're already setting up for it. So whether it's Bitcoin or whether it's digital dollar, these companies are going to be there. If I could get PayPal back down in the 130s, I'd feel much better about selling it when it got to 100, right? Because I bought it close to the IPO and then I sold it, you know, 100 ish, 90 ish. And it, and it went through levels that you wouldn't expect. But hey, money was free. DocuSign, one thing that you should know about them is that they too are blockchain. So right now you type your name into your document. And then that secures your transaction digitally or submits your paperwork digitally. In the future, we're going to have blockchain codes. That's what it sounds like. They have to make a blockchain code that we can't lose. Uh, something that is probably, you know, encrypted and then, you know, double verified. But probably there has to be some sort of a vault that protects your blockchain code somehow. So, the blockchain in the future is going to be a little bit more centralized than blockchain today, which is all about decentralization. And the reason that is, is because people will lose their access to their codes. And that's what we have to protect. We have to make sure that people can still get their blockchain code and that it's super protected. Um, uh, anything can be hacked. Uh, and, and, and really, more than anything, anything can be fished. Because people give other people information they shouldn't give 
all the darn time. In any case, so DocuSign chopped higher until it finally couldn't do it anymore. And, and this pattern here was screaming correction. So how far down is it going to come? I don't know. But your 0.5 from trough to peak would say about 150. 0.618 would be in the 120s. So somewhere between 120s and 150s, I think, is where we're going to get DocuSign. Could it go lower? Maybe. I mean, I, there's a chance it could come down here. There is. I mean, this is, seems to be had a little fight and jitterbug here before it took off. So this is probably the better way to do that. So I know there are a lot of questions about ARC on the message board in the last couple of days. Four or five people asked about it today. Um, and I happen to be writing this. So what are your thoughts about getting into ARC? What are your questions? What about the holdings? Does this make sense? There's still a lot of downside here. Citigroup just came out and talked about that. I mean, these charts, they're just not healthy. I mean, you know, again, I mean, that's, I know the people were talking about buying it. Oh, should I buy this? Should I buy that? Well, get it into your head that this is not normal. It's just not. It's not like PayPal was tremendously undervalued to start with. It started at $100 a share. So this coming back down into here, you know, I'm could bounce and come back down. You know, you have to decide for yourself, what do you want to own? You know, I hear people talk about, oh, it's got a 50 basis point expense or 75 basis point expense for management. You know what? I'm just going to tell you, you're all spoiled babies if you think that's a lot. You really are. Because this whole idea of free or almost free, that's why companies like Robinhood and all the other brokerages had to raise money. It's because they lowered the, the cost of trading to zero. Think about that. Lowered the cost of trading to zero. And then they sell your order flow so that people can cheat on front running. So 75 basis points, I don't even think that's a question. Any, any management fee under a point for managed money is 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 not worth talking about. Just figure out whether or not the management is any good. So if it's 45 basis points or 85 basis points or a point or 75 basis points, it's all the same. It doesn't freaking matter. Now if you're indexing, obviously you want a quarter point or lower. But you know, the closer you get to free, the more there are other consequences of that freeness. So yeah, you know, honestly, I mean there is not much in the financial trading or financial management industry that's overpriced anymore, other than the crappy hedge funds that are out there. I mean, I'm working for half of what I did 10 years ago, 15 years ago, especially. You know, it is what it is, but I, I wouldn't make the expenses a big deal. I mean, just decide if you like the management. Um, if you have a problem with Tesla, like I do, you need to get a pretty low price in ARC. Now, I'm also willing to accept that I might be wrong about Tesla. If she has it, as part of her portfolio, and I like the rest of the portfolio, I'm not going to get a perfect portfolio from another manager. So I have to decide what I'm willing to accept. If I'm able to manage a 20 or 30 stock portfolio, then maybe you cherry pick somewhere between six and a dozen or first stocks. Really never want to go below six, you know, maybe five, but five or six in a basket is about as small as you get. So if you're creating a solar basket, don't pick out two companies, pick out five or six, maybe as many as a dozen. A real estate basket, don't pick out one or two REITs, pick out five or six up to a dozen. You're not getting enough diversification if you're picking out one or two or three or four, and really not even five in my opinion. There's mathematical reasons why six to 12 makes sense. So if you want to cherry pick the stock, that's why I showed you DocuSign and talked about Square and PayPal I think that these are companies that these are companies that have really bright futures ahead of them. And at some price, you know, especially if they get oversold, really oversold. I mean, if we get towards these yellow bottoms of the range, just because the market gets angry, well, then you're backing up the truck, right? But down in here, the question to ask is, okay, can Teladoc go to 400 or 500 or 600 for the course of a decade? I think the answer is probably yes. Because this telemedicine is tip of the iceberg. And understand, it's going to go global. It's going to be everywhere. And American leaders usually win at that. So I would think that you should expect consolidation, your rallies. 
but these hard sell-offs, if you get cherry pricing, go ahead and buy it. But remember with stocks, it's not worth the single company risk if you don't believe that you can kick the crap out of the market with a particular stock. I mean, you should never buy any stock out there at all that you think might beat the market by one or 2%. Who cares? Buy a fund. You want five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 points beyond what the market does is a reasonable target to accept single stock risk. Why? Because you might be wrong. You know, you need to build in that margin of safety. You know, and, and you know, what's funny is that's a phrase that I first remember hearing when I was learning how to bowl. So my dad was surprised that I threw a hook in junior high, you know, bowling. He goes, where do you learn how to do that? It's like, I watch Amleto Monticelli because I would, you know, not being a big guy, I'd cup the ball. But then at the very top, when most people kept it cupped, I opened it up real wide so that I could snap through it. And I ended up bowling in college. And he said, well, when, if that's how you're going to bowl, which is a professional way to bowl, then you need to be careful about which boards you pick, meaning where do you throw the ball over? What board do you throw the ball over? Because if you throw the ball all the way out to that last board, you might come back and hit that pocket and just blow it up and just have these beautiful strikes. But you might go one board too far over if you cut it too close and go in the gutter. And that's a zero. So sometimes it's not worth trying to be too pretty because 10 pins is 10 pins. So I would move in a couple of boards with my feet and my target, and I'd have less room for guttering, but was going to have about as many strikes. And it wasn't uncommon for me to rattle off six, seven, eight, nine strikes. Never rattle off 12. But I was a six, seven, eight, nine strike guy. And that's what you need to learn to do here is with these charts, they're important. And the people who tell me that they don't want to understand it or they don't want to use charts, I'm just going to tell you over and over again, you're wrong. I've been doing this for three decades. I came into this business with people telling me the charts were wrong. And for a while, I believed it. And then I watched how they work and work and work and worked over and over and over and over again. So when you cherry pick these stocks out of QQQ or out of ARKK or whatever, understand that the further down you get, the more margin of safety you're getting. Presuming, you know, your fundamental analysis is right and it's not going to zero. I don't know what the next meme stock will be. I, I don't. GameStop is insane. It shouldn't it shouldn't be more than 20 or 30 or $40 a share. Did it just go up into the hundreds again? Who knows? Who knows? And who cares? Pick out great companies and some fund manager will buy it. You know, Kathy Wood does not really have that much money under management. Just think that through. $50 billion is piss in the ocean. So she's not really that big of a deal. She's just been hot. Anybody remember any names like that from 1999 or 2007? Yeah, there's names out there. People who were the big deal 10 and 15 and 20 years ago, and they disappeared. Why? They had their hot streak. They were Dave Kingman. Hit 50 home runs in a season and were out of baseball the next year. So always remember the thing with high premiums. High premiums mean high risk. So you really need to stick with overbought on the weekly. I mean, if you're going out more than a few weeks, so you said you sold the April... 350. Well, that'd be way down here. I don't know if we can get there that fast. So you'd think that it would have a bounce. It might bounce over you. But you know, it's not impossible that remember, split adjusted, split adjusted. I was telling people to sell Tesla around a hundred dollars a share. It's 572 coming off of 900. Remember, we talked about buying it down here, selling it here, and then it went like this. How much of this is imaginary? How much of it is wishful thinking? I think in the here for sure, right? Anything above here, I think is for sure wishful thinking. That's pretty big support line with resistance broke through, came up right here and right there. It's so whatever price that is, 300-ish, 310, 320. Yeah, 350 minus that premium. You might get lucky actually and get it put to you. That might be close to a net bottom. It, it's so hard to predict Tesla though. You know, what people don't understand about Tesla, because the stock's gone up, they think it's a great company. They've never made any money on their products, ever, never, ever. Everything's a projection as far as margins on the products. They've made all of their money, all of their money on those carbon credits. We'll see. We'll see if they can make money. I think that Ford Mach-E is going to be the canary in the coal mine 
for Tesla. If that Mach E sells off the shelves and they have to build more, run for the hills on Tesla because their solar isn't doing anything either. You'd think it should, but the problem is solar just gets better so fast that being the producer of the panels, you know, that's why I don't really talk about Maxion anymore. Services might be where it's at. And in paying attention to how consumerism works, it is the consumers, the consumables and the services that make the money. Don't be enamored by high capital intensity things. And cars are high capital intensity. The reason I like Ford is because it was priced almost for bankruptcy and it ain't going anywhere. There'll come a day after a big rally with Ford where I go, you know what? I still might drive a Ford. Still is going to be a good company, but there's nothing to make on stock. That's what I'm trying to tell people with Exxon. Exxon is at the same price that it was 15 years ago. And I got people telling me what a great company it is. Bullshit. Exxon's not a good company. Um, somebody mentioned Sun Power. Uh, I do think that Sun Power is just about where we need it to be. Daily chart. So the weekly is not quite over, over, oversold yet, but the daily's been there. Daily's there. So I think you should be selling cash secured puts, right? See that spot right there? And I would, so a stock that Kathy Wood might add might be this one. This would make a lot of sense for her to add this one. I mean, get all the way down here. How many people when it was up here were like, ah, Kirk, it's not going to get back down to 29 or 30. These charts start to make a lot more sense. If you cover this up, you go back to here, and then you just make the line go like this, that'd make a lot more sense, wouldn't it? So we're racing a lot of the hopium. Now, will we overshoot? I don't know. Depends on the U.S. Treasury. That U.S. Treasury heads to two, we're going to overshoot. In which case, we might get sun power in the teens again, right? This bottom yellow line is back up the bus. Back up the truck, get on the bus, right? Drive your own bus. Closing in, closing in. You know, I'll say a quick look at QQQ. I drove into this a couple weeks ago. Look at that. So this comes down to here or lower. Then you're going to get that rally up here. Then that 2.618 becomes a target. But I tell you about the first year of the presidency. This is the year where they're going to let the market get beat up. Be patient. Look for your spots. You're going to get them. I'll keep doing these lists every Monday and what we should be looking at, what's getting close. And you're going to get a chance to buy quality now soon. And QQQ or buying a number of these, you know, in your own basket, it's the way to go. I, I will say, when you take a look at the, the holdings on QQQ, you know, it's just so easy to buy this when it's cheap, right? So if it gets down to here, hard not to want it. Now, I did think that this was expensive. So, I mean, there is a possibility it gets, you know, I don't know if these bottom fishing prices are awfully low, but this level here, right? You got two lines there. That one, low 200s on QQQ. Tough not to buy that, right? Somebody asked about Baba. Um, I'm not going to buy it, right? Too much risk for me. So it's getting back down to the same spot where I said in normal times, these bibs would be important. Look at that. Went up, came all the way back down. Will it hold this line again, right? This is resistance resistance, support, support, and it got an up signal. I don't know. I'd much rather own this for the diversification and less China risk. You know, if you're not, if you're not afraid of the commies, I'm just telling you that you should be. They're liars, they're cheaters, they're thieves. They're angry little bureaucrats. I mean, there's not really anything nice you should say about them. I'm a nice guy. I try, try to say nice things about everybody. I'd buy this instead of Baba. I wouldn't own a single individual Chinese stock. And in fact, I'm probably going to take them off of the um, the all stocks list again. They're just, they're just not worth dealing with. There's just way too much risk. If you're going to own them, own them as a basket so that if they get mad at one billionaire for saying that the system needs some tweaking, then at least it doesn't blow them all up. But this middle 50s line... I do have my order set at 54, I think it is, or 53. I'd have to check the Ameritrade. So this is getting close. Oversold on the daily, so you'd expect a little bounce. It's not oversold on the weekly. So a little bounce, maybe up to here, to 67-ish, then heading down into the 50s. I'll own it if it gets in this box. And at this point, it looks pretty much inevitable to me. Within one, by June, say by June, this one's going to be in the box. Thank <laughs> you.
Jack Ma's made a couple appearances. He was he was uh, seen golfing. He spoke on some webinar. But my point with regard to China is, let's put it this way. Say this guy, this seems to be doing pretty good sometimes, but you've known him a long time. You've just never trusted him. Comes to you and says, hey, I'm going to start another business. You know, it's a, something I own. And, um, and you can trust me. It's going to be a pretty big deal. I want to give you a chance to get in on this. Why don't you give me X amount of dollars and I'll pay you back two years, a little bit of interest, and I'll give you a little equity kicker. But you've known this guy a long time. He doesn't tend to deliver on his promises. Big promises undershoots over and over and over again. Do you give him the money? That's China. Go ahead and say commies out loud. It'll make you smile. It's only a few words in the English language that make you smile. Commies is one of them to me. I know you can think of a few more. Look, the commies aren't on your side. I don't know why you'd invest directly in them. If you want exposure, get into a fund. EMQQ is the way to go. I highly doubt I'm going to open a hedge fund anytime soon, but I have become a lot more active at taking in new clients. Um, I'm only taking in a few a month, but it's enough. What are my thoughts on Lumen? I, I like it. It's on the verge of a major breakout, right? Breaks through this last band of resistance. I mean, it could rally all the way up to the low 40s, excuse me, low 20s. There hasn't been anything negative. I've been talking about this stock for a year. There's like nothing negative about this. It should have never come down as much as it did. And Reddit, the Reddit kids seem to like this one. So this pattern here, look at the pattern of some of the other Reddit stocks. This one's getting built up. This one could scream. Where would I sell it? Well, clearly that 4.618 is the one that busts everybody, right? 4.618. I mean, yeah, I mean, this could rally over 30. It really easy could rally over 30. I'm not, I'm not just saying that. I, I think it could double from here, no sweat. So if you've been selling puts, if you own the stock, I sure wouldn't, I sure wouldn't sell it. I mean, it's over, it's overbought, so you're probably gonna pull back here to be a chance to sell puts if you uh, already have a position, be a chance to buy if you don't. And that looks like somewhere in the 12s, you know, come off and then it'll head back up. Eventually fundamentals matter in both directions, right? Upside and downside. Where were my, it's reverted. You talk about a safe way to play an unsafe sector. So yeah, if Kinder Morgan breaks through this price, which is upper 16s, if you get a 17 handle on here, it's probably gonna go all the way through to over 20 pretty quick. And then the question becomes, is can it break through this, which is what it was trying to do before the pandemic? Because remember, it was a lot higher at one point. So where is that line? Man, Kinder Morgan can run, you know, for sure to 30-ish, it looks like. But could it go all the way into the 40s? Oof, maybe, maybe. It had, a, it had a pretty good stabilization. It started to move and then pandemic. Lumen will be bought out. Lumen won't be bought out. Parts of it will be. Yeah, um, probably about time we recharted this one. Uh, Where does this belong? I don't think we see this one in the 60s again. What is our dividend at $100? We're at 123. Yield 2%, yeah. Ah, it has to come down pretty far. I think right in here, that would be the spot where I'd buy it. Somewhere in the 90s. You get in the 90s, I, I could bless that one. I'll update the chart over on the list. All right, we're moving slow. Let's call it a day. Slowly getting the charts updated. All right, everybody, have a good one. I'll uh, get this edited tonight.